rather brilliant book. That's a plug for you, Dave. Um, the Gardening Jungle. And um, it was a weekend lockdown and I just thought, you know, the quieter roads, the sunny weather, I know it seems like a long time ago, we're all stuck at home. People were starting to turn their attention to the gardens and maybe we're starting to notice things a little bit more. I noticed like the birds singing more and I kept looking out to my pond and thinking, oh, what's come today? And in Dave's book, another plug for you, Dave, The Bee Quest, he talks about how every kid has a bug period and he never grew out of his. And this curiosity for insects has led him on a hunt around the world to find some of the rarest bees. It meant that he founded the Bumblebee Conservation Trust, is a professor at Sussex University and has written loads of scientific papers and lots of passionate, witty and I would say accessible science books explaining how the fate of mankind in, is inextricably linked and intertwined with insects. So that's why I thought it would be a brilliant Zoom talk. So welcome Dave. Thank you. Shall I kick off? Good. Why not? Yeah, thank you. <laughs> thank you everyone for, for joining us. Um, I'm now going to attempt the, the tricky task of sharing my screen which worked 10 minutes ago but um, this is the moment of truth. Uh, da, 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 da. Okay, so hopefully you can all now see a bumblebee sitting on a crocus flower. That good? Karen Nod. Yes, it's all good. Excellent. So I'm going to talk, as you realised already, thank you very much, Karen, for the introduction and for um, uh, organising all of this. Um, I'm going to talk to you about insects, which is a as you've gathered my favourite subject and I, I have been um, lucky enough to spend my whole life chasing around after insects and, and bizarrely people pay me to do this which is lovely um, and I, it started I don't know where it came from when I was four or five years old this bug phase which I think so many kids go through and I, I remember finding these little yellow and black caterpillars at this time of year actually and, and they were in the school playground on some groundsel growing in some cracks in the in the tarmac and I, I put them in my lunchbox and took them home and eventually turned it into these beautiful red and black moths which cinnabar moths I'm sure many of you will recognize and I was completely hooked I thought that was amazing uh, anyway I've been studying them ever since uh, and uh, spent the last 25 or 30 years studying bumblebees in particular this is my Youngest son, Seth, he's, he was eight when this was taken, and he's still in his bug phase. He loves insects. That's his pet cockchafer, for Colin. Sadly, Colin's no longer with us. He, um, and, uh, anyway, we won't go into the details, but, uh, um, but, but Seth absolutely loves He's got Tupperware boxes and jam jars and all sorts of insects that he catches and tries to look after. And it doesn't always go as well for the insects as they might wish, but... Uh, um, but he's really into them and I think loads of people are but sadly they tend to grow out of it um, and the reaction of most teenagers and adults to anything that, that anything small and buzzy that comes near them is to try and swat it that they're, they're frightened they think it's going to sting them or bite them um, and then that's really sad because insects as we'll see are, um, are amazing creatures they're I mean, I, I wish everyone, I don't understand why everyone doesn't love insects, but at the very least, people should respect insects because they're really, really important. We do indeed depend upon them. But before I say any more about insects, um, some sort of bigger picture stuff. So this, of course, is our beautiful planet. It's this amazing, unique rock hurtling through space with maybe 10 million species of animals and plants clinging to its surface. It's the most improbable place and it's, it's our home. It gives us everything we have. Food, water, air to breathe, source of inspiration and beauty and, and everything else. And so uh, why on earth are we making such a terrible mess of it? It's, it's beggar's belief that we're so irresponsible with our planet. And I don't need to talk you through all of these things, climate change, soil erosion, so on and so on and so on. We're all painfully familiar with the many, many interacting harms we're doing to our planet. My main focus is on biodiversity loss down at the bottom there. Um, uh, and 
I think so we are most scientists agree now in the the sixth mass extinction event um, uh, there's it's really hard to estimate but but the best guess is that there's roughly a species going extinct every hour on the planet so while I'm talking to you something somewhere will disappear and statistically the chances of it's are pretty high that it will be some kind of insect because they make up the bulk of life on earth about two-thirds of all the species we know of are insects and that tends to be forgotten um, when people think about extinctions and biodiversity loss they tend to focus on big mammals and birds and the sort of charismatic megafauna the tigers and rhinos and the like um, and they focus on the very rare the about to go extinct um, and I think we've forgotten about the, the, the declines in abundance of things that used to be common, which are now oh, better than they used to be. Um, and also, until very nobody was paying any attention to the insects and what was happening with them. In fact, it was really in, three years ago in 2017 that people really woke up to what was happening with insects. With the publication of a study from Germany, I was one of the authors um, but I didn't actually collect any of the data or really do very much at all. Um, I, I helped them write it up, but uh, it was a study of insects caught in malaise traps. That funny Malay? thing Malay. is the malaise trap. Um, no, it's okay, I've got to sell. Sell. Every, uh, can I just ask everyone to mute Malay. their microphones, please? Um, uh, so, uh, and so catches flying insects and uh, teams of German insect enthusiasts um, have been putting these um, traps up all on nature reserves actually all over Germany um, and what the graph shows you is the weight of insects caught per day um, per trap um, so it's a kind of insect biomass uh, and it fell by 76 percent in 26 years from 1989 to 2016, um, which is pretty astonishing, terrifying. Um, when, when I first saw the numbers, I couldn't quite believe it, but there have since been other studies corroborating this. Now I could show you graph after graph after graph from other countries. It would get really depressing. The first part of this talk is quite depressing, I'm afraid, but I'll spare you. You'll have to take my word for it. If I were to show you the graphs for UK butterflies or hoverflies or bees or moths, they would all look broadly similar. Maybe not quite as steep, but nonetheless, it seems that generally insects are in rapid decline. And that should really worry us. And that nobody put it better than E.O. Wilson, Ed Wilson, who's a, he's in his 90s now, but he's um, an American scientist, an ant specialist, uh, and a great champion of insects. And as he said, if all mankind were to disappear, the world would regenerate back to the rich state of equilibrium that existed 10,000 years ago. So basically, if people were to miraculously disappear, the planet would do very well without us. But if insects were to vanish, the environment would collapse into chaos, as he put it. And he's absolutely right, and I need to explain why that's true. So I've already pointed out that insects make up the bulk of all life on Earth that we know of. Um, and there are probably several million species yet to be identified. Um, uh, but as well as making up the bulk of biodiversity, um, insects are food for an awful lot of the rest of biodiversity. There are very many bird species, insects as food, as do freshwater fish, frogs, got in um, that <laughs> lizards uh, and bats and so on and so on. An awful lot of organisms would starve. So imagine if you're a bee eater, one of these beautiful things living in Germany, there are there, essentially your food supply has fallen by a quarter in the last, uh, by three quarters in the last 26 years, which is inevitably going to have big impacts on populations of insect eating creatures. But it, that's just one of the many roles that insects play in ecosystems. They do a myriad of other things, things like acting as biocontrol agents, so ladybirds, hoverflies, earwigs, lacewings, all there. I'll challenge you to work out which is which. Um, I hopefully, you know, um, uh, are all important at controlling crop pests, which admittedly themselves are often insects. And then you've got things like dung beetles that get rid of dung, and the carrion beetle, the red and black beast there, 
which helps to get rid of dead bodies and ants that distribute seeds and all sorts of insects that keep the soil healthy. And essentially, insects are involved in more or less every ecological process you can think of on land or in fresh water. Um, so uh, without them, essentially nothing much would work at all. Of course, oh, sorry. Um, let me just dwell a little bit on a couple of these insects, the less well-known ones perhaps, or the less loved ones. Um, starting with this beast, which is a lacewing larvae, one of several species of lacewing we have in this country. Um, it, it's not the most beautiful animal you've ever seen, probably. Um, it's it's um, a, a predator of aphids, so it's very important to us. Uh, it has these big kind of curved jaws uh, that you can see there, bottom left, that it stabs into aphids. It's a pretty small creature, this. It's, they're, they're very common. Um, but you'll, people tend not to spot them because they're only a few millimetres long. It stabs its jaws into the aphids and sucks the, the aphid dry, sucks all the juice out of it. But then the, this particular species of lacewing larvae uh, then puts the, the dried husk on its back. So the reason it looks so weird is it's covered in a, a sort of crazy wig made up of dried aphids, which is kind of cool. Nobody knows why they do it. I guess it's maybe it's camouflage or I don't know, maybe it's just showing off what it's caught. Anyway, beautiful little creatures. One more, um, earwigs. Now, many people don't like earwigs terribly much. They kind of a bit scurry. They've got those ferocious looking pincers at the back that might nip you. Um, and, and for a long time, they were thought to be pests of uh, crops like apples. And farmers who had apple orchards used to spray insecticides to kill the earwigs because they do sometimes nibble the blossom or bruised parts of the fruit. Um, but actually, it's, it's more recently been discovered that earwigs are really important by a control agents again. They're nocturnal, and at night, earwigs like to climb up trees and eat aphids. Um, and so if you've got a healthy earwig population in an orchard, that can eat as many aphids as if the farmer were to spray three times a year with insecticides. So they're really effective at keeping the aphid numbers down. Of course, if you do spray the insecticide, you don't just kill the aphids, you kill all the earwigs. And uh, we'll come back to that later. Um, anyway, um, very important, and we should look after our earwigs. Also just kind of fascinating, because they're one of the a rare insect in that they show parental care. This is a female earwig with her babies. She has a little pile of eggs there that are beginning to hatch, and she's guarded those eggs and licked them to keep them clean. Um, and she defends the young uh, nymphs as they grow um, until she decides it's time for them to leave the nest and then she, she shoes them out. Um, and she isn't a perfect mother because at that point if they don't go, uh, she eats them. So um, it's a good story if you've got teenage kids that you're trying to give them a bit of a hint they might think about moving home, tell them about the earwig. Anyway, gorgeous little creatures and much maligned. They don't go in ears by the way. Of course, the thing that insects do that's most famous um, in terms of the, the ecosystem services, as it's often rather dryly put, um, the things that benefit us humans, um, is pollination. Um, when I mention pollination, you probably think of bees, um, and bees are certainly very important pollinators. There's a lovely bumble top left. But we shouldn't forget there are lots of other pollinating insects, moths butterflies, various different species of fly, wasps, beetles, and, and so on. It's estimated that maybe 6,000 species of insects just in the United Kingdom contribute to, to pollination. Um, but bees are the kind of masters at it because they, they don't just eat pollen or nectar as adults, they have to collect it for their offspring as well. Um, unlike, say, a butterfly, which just drinks nectar as an adult, um, and its caterpillars don't uh, aren't interested in flowers. In bees, the offspring are fed by the parents and the parents have to collect enough pollen and nectar to keep their brood healthy, which means they have to visit a lot of flowers and they've evolved all sorts of mechanisms to help them, uh, including one of the unique features of bees. Um, it's a microscopic one, but they have branched hairs on their bodies which help to trap the pollen. And you can see this bee here has trapped a lot of pollen. It's probably trapped so much that it can barely fly. But it I think it's a really nice illustration of how good they are as pollinators. You can imagine every time that bee lands on a flower, she's going to leave behind some pollen grains, which 
course, is what the flower wants. So bees and other insects pollinate 87% of all plant species on the planet and 75% of all the crops that we grow. Uh, so we've got used to supermarkets full of this amazing array of produce from all over the world, but most of it is dependent on pollinators. If we didn't have them, it wouldn't look so good. We wouldn't have things like apples or cherries or uh, strawberries or raspberries or blueberries or, or pumpkins or tomatoes or chili peppers or even chocolate or coffee. Life would be unbearable. And actually, literally, we couldn't feed everybody without, um, without pollinators, certainly not a healthy, healthy diet because most of our vitamins comes from stuff that insects have pollinated. So we really need to look after them. We need to avoid ending up like these people. These pictures you may have seen before, they've become quite famous. They're from Southwest China and they're pictures of people hand pollinating their apple and pear orchards because there aren't any insects left to do it for them. Um, so it's actually a pretty chilling sight when you think about it and we need to make sure this doesn't happen elsewhere. Can you imagine a British farmer hand pollinating his oilseed rape field? There is one solution to the bee crisis which has, is being widely touted uh, which uh, I also find quite chilling and that is that uh, there are a number of labs around the world including in the UK that are trying to build robot bees, replacement bee bots, drones, whatever you like to call them, to, to pollinate flowers in, instead of real bees. Um, I think it's nuts. I mean, I, I can't imagine how much energy and resources, um, all the ma metals and plastics and so on, it would need, we'd need to build enough of these things to actually pollinate the world's crops if we couldn't do it with real bees or, or other insects. Um, it, you may be wondering why there's a bubble on a flower there, and that's because the very latest paper I've seen on this is from a, Chinese, a Japanese group who uh, are trying to build drones that have little like uh, bubble making machines that hang under them, a um, bit like a, a, it looks very like a child's bubble making machine stuck glued to a drone. And it, but the bubbles have got pollen in them and it sprays out polleny bubbles all over the crop in the hope of um, pollinating the flowers. Well, th that's all very well, but they haven't got over how you collect the pollen in the first place from the flowers to put in the bubble mix. So it's not as, as ingenious as it sounds. Anyway, I'm getting sidetracked slightly. Um, it seems nuts to me when we have real bees that have been pollinating flowers for 120 million years, um, they're biodegradable and carbon neutral and self-replicating. They seem to have kind of a, all the properties you'd want in a in a pollinator, why on earth would we want to, to replace them? Let's hope we don't end up in a world with robo bees. So, um, sorry, I did warn you, this is quite depressing in places, the, the, the doom and gloom will come to an end. Um, if we're gonna reverse these declines and make sure we hang on to our bees and other insects, we need to understand what's making them disappear in the first place. Uh, and unfortunately it's quite complicated, there are lots of things driving their declines. I've put up a list there and I could probably add to it if I really tried. But they're roughly in order, I think, of how serious they are. Loss of habitat has probably been the biggest driver of insect declines, followed by the impacts of pesticides. And I won't say any more about the others, but I will say a tiny bit more about, about those two. So firstly, We've lost lots of different insect friendly habitats, um, but it, from a, a European perspective, probably the, the one that was most important to uh, insects, particularly to pollinators, was flower rich, species rich grasslands. And we used to have, in, in Britain alone, we had 7 million hectares of these in 1930. Um, most of them were lowland hay meadows cut by farmers for hundreds of years managed in the same way, cut to provide hay for livestock. Uh, also chalk downland um, was, is a similarly species rich grassland maintained by sheep grazing primarily. But we essentially swept it all away. Uh, we lost somewhere between 97 and 99% of this habitat in the 20th century. There's precious little of it left. And we replaced it with either arable crops 
or fields of bright green grass grown for silage, neither of which really supports any insect life at all. So it's not surprising that our insects have declined. We've also simplified the landscape pretty dramatically. Um, these are aerial pictures. They're actually not from the UK, they're from uh, Western France. Um, and the first picture top left was taken in 1958 and it's a time series of the same place through to 2010 bottom right and uh, it speaks for itself really i think it's 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 this a very dramatic illustration of how the countryside has changed i suspect most of britain would look the same if you had similar pictures we used to have lots of small fields essentially with lots of different crops and now we just have giant fields with few boundaries and, and very little diversity. And, it, and again, it kind of speaks for itself. It's pretty obvious why that landscape bottom right is less hospitable to biodiversity than the one top left. And it's funny because this has happened within the lifetime of, I'm not quite old enough to have been alive in 1958, but within the lifetime of some people listening, I'm sure. Um, and yet we really struggle to notice it because it was gradual, you know, it was just the odd hedge here and there being ripped out, the odd field merged together. But over 50 years, the landscape completely changed. So my second driver that I was going to say a tiny bit more was pesticides. Um, uh, I could talk about this for hours, but it would, you wouldn't, you'd be quite bored um, and very depressed. Um, but just to give you a few headline figures, uh, in the UK, we currently spray 16.9 thousand tonnes of pesticide onto the landscape every year. That's just farm use, doesn't include in towns and gardens. Um, and they, bear in mind that those are, these are chemicals specifically designed to kill stuff, uh, many of them insecticides. Um, and they kill the good insects as well as the bad insects. Um, each field on average receives just over 17 sprays a year. That's sort of 17 treatments a year. That could be the same pesticide being sprayed 17 times or, or a mix of 17 pesticides sprayed all at once. But it, it's a lot, um, whichever way you look at it. And more worryingly, that seven, figure of 17 sprays per field has increased by 80% 80, 80 since 1990 in the last um, no, sorry, since 1995, so in the last 25 years, um, which suggests that farming is still going in the wrong direction to me. We are using more and more pesticides. And again, you know, it's hardly surprising that insects aren't thriving in that field. Okay, so that's most of the doom and gloom dealt with. We can cheer up a bit because there's good news. We can fix this, it's not too late. There are still, few insects have actually gone extinct. Uh, and they breed quite fast if we just provide them with somewhere to live, something to eat, and we stop poisoning them. Uh, and we can all get involved in helping them because there are things that everyone can do. So one of the most obvious things we might do is make our gardens more wildlife friendly and more broadly turn our cities and towns and villages into a giant network of, of nature reserves, not just for insects, but for, for everything. Um, I, I have this kind of fanciful, crazy vision where, um, you know, every garden in Britain has bee and butterfly friendly flowers and doesn't use pesticides and the council are on board. So all the parks and roundabouts and road verges and cemeteries and so on and so on are all full of wildflowers. Um, I think that would just be brilliant and it's completely achievable. There's not, uh, as far as I'm concerned, any downside to that at all. I've written a book about it. There you go. Just plugging myself again. Sorry. Just because I just say, just say, please don't buy it off Amazon. It's an awful, they don't pay any taxes and, and authors get almost no money for books sold through Amazon. Anyway, you probably weren't going to buy it anyway. So don't worry. Um, so what can we all do if we have a garden? Um, well, one obvious thing, one, the easiest thing in the world, something to do less of rather than more of is just reduce the amount of mowing you do and it's amazing how many flowers are in most lawns if you just stop cutting for a few weeks this this is the picture of my lawn and i didn't sow any wildflowers in it at all and you can see it's got red clover and white clover and buttercups and there's some self heal there and 
you can't see them, but there's speed wells and dandelions and all sorts of other things in there. Um, they just miraculously appear, and then it, as soon as you, as soon as they appear, they attract insects, and it all comes to life. So, next time you get the urge to to, to mow, you know that we do have this strange compulsion in Britain to try and recreate a kind of stripy Wimbledon tennis court in our gardens. I don't know why. Um, it's a waste of petrol, and it's terrible for wildlife. Every time you mow, you get rid of the bulk of the vegetation, and you essentially hoover up and macerate any insect foolish enough to venture into your lawn. Let it grow long, and it will fill up with life. Of course, there's lots of grassland owned by local authorities as well, road verges and so on, which tend to be also mown over and over again. And of course, there's been a lot of debate about this in recent months on social media, um, because some councils did stop mowing so much um, because of the lockdown. And many people thought that was a great thing, including me. Um, anyway, there's clearly a lot more we could do to encourage wildflowers and these kind of greens, urban green spaces of one sort or another. And this picture is of um, a wildflower patch sown by a little community grassroots group called On The Verge up in Stirling in Scotland. Um, now these people essentially just spend their weekends um, digging over and, uh, any patch of grassland that they can get their hands on and sowing it with wildflowers. And there's now nearly a hundred patches like this dotted all over Stirling. That's a road verge, there's a roundabout. They've got one in a prison yard, one in a primary school playing field, one next to a rugby pitch. They're all over the place. Everywhere you go, you see flowers. It's brilliant. Um, why can't every roundabout and every road verge and every bit of green space in Britain be covered in flowers? I think that would just be fantastic. Okay, kind of relating to that, I, I'd love it if, if everyone were a little bit more relaxed about what they regard as weeds. We've, we've arbitrarily decided that some plants are undesirable and that we should persecute them. And we spend an awful lot of time and effort and sometimes money um, trying to kill them. Uh, things like dandelions and thistles and ragwort. Or what is it about ragwort? People hate ragwort. They, they, all these exaggerated claims that it kills thousands of horses a year. It doesn't, it really doesn't. It is poisonous if they eat it, but horses don't eat live ragwort. It's only if you make a, you dry it in large quantities in hay and then feed it to your horses, which is pretty dumb. Anyway, it's a fantastic plant for wildlife. Um, it, it supports those cinnabar moths that I mentioned at the beginning uh, that eat the foliage, but dozens and dozens of insects come to drink the nectar and gather the pollen like this skipper butterfly here. Um, so my sort of top tip is that you can get rid of all the weeds in your garden with a click of your fingers if you just rename them all wildflowers and be done. And we really need to stop doing this, don't we? Isn't that awful? I just, oh, it makes, uh, makes my stomach churn to see that. That poor bit of vegetation, what harm was it doing? Someone came along, probably a guy on a quad bike from the local council with a tank on the back and sprayed it with glyphosate, I would guess. Um, glyphosate, Roundup, um, it's a probable carcinogen um, and yet we spray it all over our parks and uh, uh, along the sides of our pavements and so on. It's absolutely nuts. Why can't we just be a little bit more tolerant? And generally, not just get rid of glyphosate, I think our urban areas, our gardens, our green spaces should all be pesticide free. France declared all pesticides are essentially banned in urban areas for anyone to use. You can't buy pesticides in France unless you're a, a registered farmer now. Um, so gardeners can't buy them. It, whereas in the UK, you can buy them anywhere, can't you? They're in, not just in garden centres, but they're in DIY shops, supermarkets. Everywhere you go, there are all these bottles full of poison, basically. It's bonkers. Um, if you've got some aphids on your roses or your runner beans or whatever. If you just leave them, almost invariably, a whole army will come to your assistance. There are all these beneficial insects that will come and eat them for you if you just hold fire uh, and don't kill everything with a spray. So next time you see an outbreak of, of some pest, just wait for the cavalry to arrive. And I've put up here just some of the many, many different insects. These, these are all ones I find in my garden. All of them love to eat. The, the aphids that otherwise might eat my fruit and veg. Um, we've got lacewings, we've got ladybirds, we've got hoverflies, the earwigs I mentioned earlier, little parasitoid wasp on the left. I wonder how many of you know which, which of these immature insects belongs to which 
adult insect, you might just try and test yourself. Um, I, obviously, I told you what this was earlier. So that um, top left there, the funny beast with the, the aphid collection on its back, turns into this rather elegant um, lace wing on the right here. Um, uh, that is a top in the middle top is a ladybird larvae. Both the larvae and the adults are voracious aphid predators. And in the centre there, that fantastic beastie is a is a hoverfly larvae. There, uh, that there are some species of hoverfly whose larvae also eat aphids, as that one is doing right now. Eventually, that'll turn into the beautiful insect beneath it. Fantastic beasts all around. Why? As soon as you spray your garden with insecticide, you kill all of those things and you kill most of the aphids, but the aphids come back really fast because they haven't got any enemies anymore. And then you end up having to spray again and again and again, and it's just a vicious cycle you can never escape from. So just leave the pesticides at home, not at home, on the shelf in the supermarket. Okay, enough rant. One of the most obvious things to do is to grow bee-friendly flowers, and there's lots of information out there about which ones are best for insects, lots of YouTube videos that I've made over the years that you can see with me wandering around my garden pointing to the bee friendly flowers so do check it out um, but just as a general rule it's quite interesting that that you'd think that all flowers would be attracted to insects because that's why flowers evolve that's the purpose of a flower as far as the plants concerned is to attract pollinators that's why they have petals and scents and nectar um, but we've tinkered with flowers and sometimes we've made them unsuitable for insects in our playing around with them, making them, selecting for things that we thought were pretty. And these two pictures illustrate that really nicely. And one on the right is a kind of wild type rose, um, close to a dog rose, which insects absolutely love. The one on the left is a hybrid tea rose, a classic kind of garden flower. Um, it's useless for insects because it's a mutant in which the anthers, the things that are the little purple, blo um, little orange blobs in the centre of the, the dog rose on the right, have mutated into extra petals so there is no pollen and the insects can't get into the flower. It's just basically a useless bunch of petals. So you might think it looks pretty, but from a bee's perspective, that thing on the left is an abomination. So get rid of them. And similarly, most annual bedding plants, these kind of things that you drive to the garden centre and they're outside in racks, uh, outside supermarkets as well in the spring, busy lizzies and begonias and petunias and so on. And they're sold in disposable plastic trays, probably been reared in peat-based composts, probably been sprayed with lots of chemicals. They're hideous things. Just get rid of the lot and the gnomes, please. And, and instead grow traditional cottage garden flowers, herbs. Um, there's loads to choose from, as I say, check out my YouTube videos. I'm just going to show you a few pictures of some of my favourites, just to, uh, so you can relax for a few moments. So this is catmint, fantastic bee flower, really beautiful, really easy to grow. And we've got geraniums, um, the hardy geraniums, not to be confused with pelagoniums, which are useless. Hardy geraniums like our meadow cranes bill. And borage is a fantastic plant for bees. Lavender, of course, and comfrey, one of my absolute favourites. They go mad for this. It's got, produces loads and loads of nectar. Those are just a few. There's many, many more. Um, and why not squeeze in some wildflowers? There are many wildflowers which look beautiful in, even in a formal garden, a very tidy garden. You, you can grow, for example, top left there. That is Viper's Bugloss, which is a biennial plant, very easy to grow. And bees of it and it looks absolutely stunning. I could highly recommend it. If you've got room, and of course this isn't suitable for everyone, but try and squeeze in some flowering trees. Um, a flowering tree has the advantage that it's, because of its height, it can support many, many more blossom than the equivalent area of say a herbaceous flower bed. Um, if you stand underneath a lime tree uh, when it's in flower in late spring, the whole tree is just buzzing with insects. It's absolutely fantastic. Now, of course, most of us haven't got room for a full-size lime tree in our garden, but at the other end of the spectrum, you can get uh, many fruit trees like apples on dwarf rootstocks, uh, which are suitable for growing in a pot on a patio. Um, and even a small tree produces blossom uh, and will attract pollinators in the spring. And if it's an apple, uh, it'll produce fruit, nice, sustainable, zero food miles fruit for you 
at the end of the year. And it's also every tree you grow is locking up carbon. So there's a lot to be said for planting flowering trees wherever we can. I'd love to see these planted in our parks as well, way more flowering trees and along our streets. Wouldn't that be cool? Do beware when you're choosing what plants to grow in your garden uh, that if you buy them from a conventional garden centre, they're probably full of pesticides. Um, this, and, and I know this for a fact because we, we, we studied it in my lab at Sussex Uni. We, um, we went around the local garden centres, all the big chains, Y Vale and B&Q and Homebase and so on, and we bought specifically any flowers they were selling as bee friendly. You can see that logo there at the bottom. Or many of them were using the RHS is perfect for pollinator logo there. Um, so these were being sold as good for insects. 75% um, of them contained insecticides. Um, and actually 70% of them, this was in 2017, so three years ago, 70% of them contained neonicotinoids, which are a group of insecticides that have become notorious for, the, for being incredibly toxic to bees. And it's an absolute scandal that garden centres sell plants as bee friendly when they're full of insecticide. Also beware, you can see I love pesticides. Um, you may um, buy all your plants from an organic nursery, you might use no pesticides in your garden at all, but many of us have dogs and cats as pets, and our vet uh, advises us to treat them against fleas. In fact, vets will advise you to do that prophylactically, even if your dog hasn't got fleas. Um, now, this is the best selling flea treatment in the UK, Advocate. Um, it's made by a company called Bayer. Uh, and if you, the, you, the active ingredient you might just about be able to read is um, imidacloprid. Now that is a neonicotinoid insecticide, the things that I was just talking about. The dose that you're supposed to drip on the neck of your dog um, every month uh, is enough to kill 60 million honeybees. Now that's about four lot big lorries full of dead bees. Um, and that's every month going onto your dog. Um, these are neurotoxins, incredibly potent to insects, and they're water soluble and quite long lasting. So as soon as your dog goes out in the rain, they're going to wash off. Or if he jumps in a stream or a canal, that's a huge dose of insecticide going straight into that waterway, which doesn't seem like a good thing to me. Okay, don't use peat. I'm not going to go into this now because I haven't got time, but please, please don't use peat based composts. Um, buy peat free or make your own, it's really easy. Two more things you can do in your garden. Uh, one is make a bee hotel. These are a great fun project to make with kids. Um, all you really need is a piece of wood and an eight millimeter drill bit and drill some holes. Um, the thing on the left there is a very ugly half rotten fence post in my garden that I drilled some holes in. Um, but within 20 minutes of starting drilling, I had a red mason bee, that's one top right, coming to investigate. And now there's a nice big colony living in there. Um, the mason bees are on, the, they're finished for the year, they're on the wing in the spring. And then at this time of year, you get leaf cutter bees using any holes that are left. That's a leaf cutter bee bottom right, called a leaf cutter bee because it's, as you can see, it snips leaves and it uses the little semicircles of leaf to line its, its tunnel. So these are solitary bees. They don't live in a hive. They don't live in a, a colony like a bumblebee or a honeybee. They just live on their own and the female bee makes her own nest. Um, you can make much more attractive things than that um, by, for example, sawing up bits of bamboo and putting them in a nice attractive box. Or if you've got no DIY skills at all, you can buy bee hotels. There are lots of designs available. This is a bit expensive, but it's a real favourite of mine. It's made by a company called Nurturing Nature. You can find them online. And it has the advantage of a window on the side there, um, which lets you see what's going on inside, which you can see on the right uh, there. These are those mason bees, the red mason bees. This is their offspring in a little row inside. There's bright balls of yellow pollen. Uh, and then you can see the little grubs and you can see little walls of clay. They're called mason bees because they separate each of their offspring with a little clay wall before they uh, provision the next, next cell along. Really cool for kids to, to my, my kids absolutely love peeking in to see what's happening with the baby bees. The final slightly strange thing you might do in your garden to encourage insect life 
is one you've less likely to have heard of than a bee hotel and that's a hoverfly lagoon um, again you can find a youtube video about how to make one um, uh, or you can it, it actually it's really simple i can tell you now essentially as well as there are some hoverflies which have aphid eating larvae that live on land there are other species of hoverfly including some really beautiful ones like the tiger stripe hoverfly bottom right there which um, have aquatic larvae and they like to live in very small ponds and puddles full of rotting vegetation which are really easy to recreate in any kind of container even a chopped in half plastic milk bottle will do the job and fill it with water chuck in a handful of vegetation dead leaves lawn clippings comfrey works really well and as soon as the vegetation starts to rot the smell attracts the female flies to lay their eggs which hatch into these amazing beasts top center there that's a, a rat-tailed maggot which is not a great name it doesn't do them any favors the tail is a snorkel it's a breathing tube that they use to get oxygen while they're living deep in the murky uh, water of your hoverfly lagoon really cool creatures and again fun for kids okay so that's it for gardening that's my summary of how to make your garden wildlife and particularly insect friend friendly and as I said, it would be fantastic if every garden were and if every local council made their urban green spaces wildlife friendly. But 70% of Britain is, is farmland. Uh, and we can only do so much in our gardens. I don't think we can ever really reverse biodiversity declines unless we also find a way to make farming more wildlife friendly. Uh, and I think we have to because I would argue that the current industrial farming model is not sustainable in the long term, um, aside from dry, being a major driver of biodiversity loss and the decline of bees and pollinators and so on, uh, it's also mined the soil. We've done terrible damage to our soils. It's contributing hugely to climate change. Uh, it's contributing hugely to other type, kinds of pollution, including freshwater pollution. Um, essentially, I, I think we've gone down a dead end. And if we carry on trying to farm like this, eventually we will starve because there'll be no bees left and no soil left. Um, I think there are better ways to feed the world, basically. And I'm just going to finish off with five minutes, a bit of a hurried ramble uh, to give you some of at least my thoughts about how we might do that. So one option would be to go organic, to get rid of the pesticides. That sounds quite attractive to me, as you gathered, I'm not a big fan. Um, a counter argument would be, well, yields are a bit lower in organic, and if, if the yields are lower, then we'd need to do more farming. We'd need more land under cultivation to feed everybody if we all went organic. That sounds quite sensible, until you reflect on the fact that currently we grow about three times as many calories in the world as we need to feed the global human population. Um, there is no shortage of food. The only people, people starve because they can't afford food, not because there isn't food. There's tons of the stuff. There's so much that we're incredibly, unbelievably wasteful with it. So of all the food we grow, about a third goes to waste. Of course, we all know this. Um, and we really need to find ways to tackle food waste because it's ridiculous to, when you think about it that we do all this intensive farming with, with huge costs to the environment. And then we casually throw away a third of the food that we've produced that way. Absolutely bonkers. The other huge inefficiency in the food chain relates to meat. And you're familiar with this issue. You've probably had arguments and you've all got your own opinions about meat. Um, but I think it's an undeniable truth that we, uh, as a species, we eat too much meat uh, and particularly too much red meat. And it's just not an efficient way of feeding people. Um, my personal take is I, I'm not vegan or vegetarian, but I treat meat as, as, as a treat um, and particularly avoid any intensively reared red meat, um, particularly corn fed indoor reared animals. It's hugely inefficient to grow. So, so roughly another third of all the calories that we grow in the world are fed to animals to feed to people, which is, is a very um, inefficient way of feeding people at the end of the day. Also, uh, just to add to the, to the sort of inefficiencies of the whole system, and I, I'm really sorry about this next picture. It's, it's, it, it's not a pretty sight, is it? But we also eat too much, uh, which is another aspect of uh, this ridiculous food 
system we have. Um, we have a very poor diet globally. Um, so many of us are just eating too much and we're eating the wrong kinds of foods. We're eating too much carbohydrate and too much oil uh, and not enough fruit and veg, essentially. Um, and that's driving this epidemic of not just obesity, but diabetes, which is costing the global economy enormously. Um, in the UK, 27% um, of adults are now obese. And by coincidence, a recent government estimate put the cost of um, obesity to the economy at about 27 billion pounds a year and rapidly climbing. A lot of that is dealing with the health issues and some of that's lost days of work and so on and so on. So we've, we've got this ridiculous system which is incredibly wasteful where we're eating the wrong kinds of foods and we're actually making ourselves ill as a result. So what could we do differently? Well, a few ideas. Uh, and, and these ideas are inspired a little bit by my own vegetable garden and some research we've been doing on allotments um, around Brighton. Uh, we've been, amongst other things, quantifying um, the productivity of allotments. And it's surprising how much food they can produce. A competent allotmenter can get about 35 tonnes of fr fresh fruit and veg per hectare per year. Now an allotment is much smaller than a hectare, so I'm not suggesting that any one allotment is carting away 35 tonnes of food, that would be impressive. But if you, it's at a per hectare rate, 35 tonnes is a lot. Um, and if you compare that to, for example, wheat or oilseed rate production in industrial monocultures, wheat produces about eight tonnes per hectare, um, oilseed rates about three and a half, four tonnes per hectare. So allotmenting produces a lot of fruit and veg and it's essentially zero food miles, zero packaging, seasonal, very healthy produce, the stuff that is good for us. But what's more interesting is there was a recent study from Bristol University that showed that allotments had the highest insect biodiversity of any habitat in urban areas, higher than gardens, higher than parks, higher, interestingly, even than city nature reserves. So the reason I'm mentioning allotments is because they demonstrate quite neatly that you can have food production and biodiversity living in the same place, living hand in hand, and the two, they support each other, in fact, if it's done the right way. Um, and I think farming could learn from this. Um, there are types of farming which employ similar principles, trying to work with nature, not using pesticides, focusing on soil health, having a high diversity of crops rather, uh, rather than one or two cash crops that are harvested with huge machines. So I'm thinking of things like agroforestry, which shows enormous promise um, to be highly productive while supporting more biodiversity. Essentially, agroforestry is incorporating trees into your, crop, uh, into your cropping system, usually in lines like this or this. Um, and permaculture, um, which uh, along with biodynamic farming, both have a slightly kind of wacky reputation as being a bit alternative, but actually almost everything they do is really sensible. Uh, and I think it, my kind of vision, as well as all my stuff about gardens being insect friendly, I, th I think we need to surround our cities with a ring of horticultural farms, small scale biodynamic permaculture farms, producing all the fruit and veg that the people who live in the city need to consume. Um, if you scale it up, we only actually need about 200,000 hectares um, at 35 tonnes a hectare, uh, 200,000 hectares of fruit and veg patches would provide all the fruit and veg needed by the UK population. That's 200,000 hectares, might sound quite big, but it's, um, it's actually half the area of gardens in the UK. Um, so it's really not that much land at all, and that could supply it. Currently, we import 70% of our fruits and vegetables. Of course, we'd still need to import you know, avocados and pineapples. We're not going to be able to grow. But we, we could be a, a net neutral when it comes to fruit and vegetable production, and it would be enormously more sustainable and could support, if done the right way, an awful lot more wildlife. So basically, more of the stuff on the right and less of the stuff on the left is my view. So to finish off, Basically, 
this is our beautiful planet, of course, back to this picture. Um, we are making a terrible mess, but we don't have to. We don't have to. I, I, I find it really odd that people would do anything for their children apart from apparently leaving them a decent planet to live on. You know, there is no planet B. It's a terribly cliched thing to say, but it's absolutely true. We're not going to go and live on Mars. We need to look after what we've got. Uh, and we can, and maybe we should start by, by looking after the insects that live all around us. Thank you, everybody, for listening. Cheers. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Thank you, David. Yeah. Oh, thank you, Dave. I think thank that, you. That was absolutely brilliant. We've had quite a lot of questions, actually. Um, if I just start with, um, I think we've got a really good one from, where is it? I put this, I put a note by somebody saying, great question. That's Marie. Um, let me go back. Actually, Marie um, said that she's heard that commercial wildflower mixes often don't contain local wildlife varieties and that sowing these might not be good for the diversity of wildflowers or for the insects. Um, is it a good idea anyway, or on a big scale, if all mun municipalities start sowing the same mixes, that's not great either, is it? That's, she's no, but although much, much, much better than just having mown grass. Um, but no, it's a really good question, um, absolutely. Um, mm. so ideally, um, I, it depends on the context. If you're trying to recreate a hay meadow, a traditional, you know, like that picture I showed you, which is actually a, taken on South Uist, to one of our surviving bits of species rich hay meadow, then you should be using native species exclusively. And ideally you should be using seed collected somewhere nearby, if that's possible, if it exists. It doesn't always exist, so that's a major obstacle. Um, if, on the other hand, you're managing a roundabout in the, in the middle of Stirling in Scotland, um, then for me, I'm a bit more relaxed. I, I don't think, because it's an urban area that's already full of gardens and umpteen non-native species, then I don't think it's perhaps so crucial that we stick to, to using local provenance seed. Um, that's my take, but uh, you know, I, I'm sh I appreciate there are other opinions out there and, and some people might disagree. Sure. Okay, we've got um, another question from Claire, and she said that um, how can we stop this obsession with neat Victorian style, heavy, heavily manicured monoculture grass lawns? People seem to think that any deviation from this is messy and unsightly. Yeah, it is difficult, and we, you know, we're we're fighting a kind of decades of entrenched. You know, people, it's what people have brought up with, isn't it? And uh, um, it, one. Um, trick that I've come across is certainly so if you're a, a park manager and you don't mow the grass you will almost certainly get complaints from people who are used to it being mown and they see it as laziness that it's not being managed um, if it's unsightly I've even seen letters saying you know the children can't play in the park anymore because the grass is too long and it, they wouldn't be able to play football in the middle of a, a long grass, but they probably have a lot of fun running around and hiding and so on. But anyway, um, if that area of, of long grass in a park has a path mown through it and there's a clear sign up saying wildflower meadow, people are much less likely to complain about it um, because they can see it's a deliberate act rather than just laziness. So that helps. It doesn't, doesn't tackle the issue of private gardeners so much. But I think things are changing, you know, the, the, the world is waking up to the fact that we can't just carry on doing what we were doing before. And social media is a really powerful tool. I've seen so, so many people tweeting a, with great pride pictures of their shaggy lawns full of dandelions this spring. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, I, I think slowly um, people's attitudes are changing and we've just got to really push at that and keep you know challenging people and showing off our own own shaggy lawns full of weeds and wildflowers and uh, maybe eventually everyone will do it yeah um paul snooks has asked um do you have a theory as to why adults become so disinterested in insects 
you know and, and conversely is there something we can do to stop that happening maybe that's a good question uh i, I don't know i mean i guess we grow up we get distracted we discover the opposite sex and and having to make a living and all the other distractions of life and somehow insects and that, but it's it's not just insects is it it's that kind of sense of wonder at, at, at nature that somehow most of us seem to lose i don't know i mean thank god i i, I never did so I, I i'm probably not the best person to ask why other people do i welcome any opinions out there as to as to, as to why that happens but i, I mean i guess partly actually to, something has sensible has just occurred to me i mean most of us now live in cities and don't actually get much opportunity to encounter nature um 80 of the british population live in in towns and cities um and, and anything that's unfamiliar is more frightening isn't it you know that if, if you don't get the chance to to see bees and butterflies and grasshoppers and hold them in your hand and look at them then eventually you'll you'll perhaps you know because they're they're alien strange creatures you're frightened of them i don't know i'm guessing yeah um kate has asked and um, this is about your post with the drilled holes in she was wondering whether you need to clean it because she sees some conflicting messages there are a lot of conflicting messages about this um so obviously you can't really clean out a, a, a post with holes in it terribly easily uh, you can get designs of b hotel that you can dismantle um uh, and then you can easily clean them out and some people advocate that if you don't clean them out um you can get a build-up of pollen mites which are these little um uh, mites that's, that hitchhike on the bees and jump off in the nest and eat, eat the pollen and if you don't them they eat all the pollen so that the young bees starve and then the, the bee population will crash um, but then the mites will die and the bees will come back and i kind of think well maybe isn't that a sort of natural and don't the don't the pollen mites deserve somewhere to live too you know uh, uh, so actually what i the, my pragmatic kind of solution to this is i have some bee hotels that i clean out and some that i can't clean out so i just leave them and they all seem to work to varying degrees and i have lots of bees but i do have a few pollen mites and i have cuckoo bees and and some parasitoid wasps that turn up and so on and as far as i'm concerned that's all part of nature you know bees manage pretty well for 120 million years without anyone cleaning out their nests for them. So um, I'm not sure that it's really entirely necessary. Mm, great. Um, I don't know whether you can answer this, but we've had George saying that he's having trouble with a neighboring sheep farmer who keeps spraying herbicides and has killed off his hedgerow willow trees. And he's wondering what he can do about it. Um, that's, I, 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 I mean, I, clearly, I guess he's already had words with the farmer, and uh, yeah. uh, they're not best friends, I imagine. Um, well, you should not be spraying it. You should, a, a hedgerow should not be sprayed with herbicide, should it? That seems like terrible mismanagement because obviously they're, you know, uh, presumably the farmer wasn't trying to kill willow trees. One hopes, anyway. Um, whether that's incompetence or spite or something, I, I have no idea. But. Um, I don't have a solution to that one, I'm afraid. I mean, I, I, I wish, I don't understand why a sheep farmer would be resorting to liberal spraying of herbicides anyway. They're much more commonly used by arable farmers to, but in a, an ungrazed pasture, you don't normally have terrible weed problems. So I don't really know what's going on there. Mm. Sorry. Yeah, well, Philip has mentioned arable farmers. He's asked whether we, we can get the same yields without spraying. Well, it's interesting. I mean, if you removed sprays completely and fertilizers, i.e. went organic, mm. there have been some big kind of global studies suggesting organic farming produces about 80% of the yield. So it's not a, that big a drop. Um, and when you consider all these issues I mentioned about food waste and so on, then, you know, we can actually easily feed the world without any pesticides at all. Um, but uh, that's not going to happen anytime soon, I'm, I'm sure. But to, to, to highlight something else, I pointed out that um, the number of pesticides sprayed has increased by 80% in the last 25 years. There's been very little increase in yield going alongside that increase in spraying. And there hasn't been any sudden massive emergence of lots of new pests or anything. So 
one has to ask why are farmers using more and more pesticides every year and i i think the solution the the, the explanation is largely marketing pressure so you look at the farming press is chock full of adverts for pesticides and the agronomists who advise farmers the majority of them work for pesticide companies and the poor farmer doesn't have an independent source of advice about what pesticides he really needs and what which ones he can do without we used to have a government funded advisory service adas which had the job of giving farmers independent advice but we closed it down because it was too expensive and uh, well, privatized what was left of it uh, so now farmers are completely at the mercy of, of the agrochemical companies touting their products so that's my take on on the situation but uh, you know we're all susceptible to to marketing pressure and being told something you know is is fantastic and uh, you know who can say they haven't been bought something that they didn't really need on that basis um yeah. so i i think there's there's lots of evidence that we could certainly reduce pesticide use but we would need to support farmers in 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 knowing you know what how they could do things differently um i there's a sorry i'm, I'm giving a very long answer but when I was university, there was um I was, I was given lectures on a thing called IPM, Integrated Pest Management, which is basically a philosophy that was developed back in the 1970s and 80s of treating the pesticide as the last resort. And you use a whole array of techniques, including resistant crop varieties and crop rotations and trap crops and encouraging natural enemies and so on. And if only if all of that fails, do you, do you use the pesticide? And that's where we need to move back to, I think. And you know, there are very few people would disagree, scientists would disagree with that. In fact, I don't think any scientists would disagree with that. But it, it's, it's, it's making it actually happen and it really it needs that kind of investment, needs governments to support it. Yeah. Um, um, I, I bet a few people are thinking this. Uh, Neil Savage has said, if there was just one thing that we could each do, and maybe this is even like tomorrow, I suppose, to help increase insects, what would that one thing be? What's the first thing we could do? Oh, there's so many things I could say at that point. There's no one thing. We just all need to do lots of little things, really. I mean, you know, plant, plant a cat mint, put up a bee hotel, stop using pesticides, leave your mower in the shed, dig a pond. Um, any of those would all be great. And if everyone did all of them, that would be fantastic. Um, write a letter to your MP, tell him to make sure the agriculture bill actually delivers uh, it, the green Brexit that Michael Gove promised us. Um, I can't see it happening, but uh, sorry. Uh, but yeah, we need to kind of rise up. You know, we need, we need everybody to step up and, and look out for insects and, and, you know, the planet at the end of the day. I mean, it, insects are just a symptom of the, what's happening with insects is, 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 is very similar to what's happening with many other aspects of our environment, sadly. Great. Okay, well, we've got to seven minutes past eight. Um, is, is there, I'm just trying to think if there's anything, we've got some other questions, but a few of them are, you've kind of answered already actually, um, with what you've said. Um, is there anything that you've, you'd like to say, Dave, anything just to sum up what you've said? Oh, I thought I summed it up at the end of the talk. I can't do it again. No, it's, I mean, you know, just please everybody take this seriously because, because I mean, I guess I'm talking to the converted here and that, that is the danger that we're all in a bubble and we all think everyone agrees with us, but actually what really, I think 95% of the population have not engaged with any of these issues and they have no idea what a mess we're making. So somehow we have to, we have to, I, I kind of think, sorry, I, this is not a quick summing up at all. It's all right. <laughs> there's, there's a tipping point that we're quite close to where people's attitudes will suddenly change. You know, that there's, there is a, an awakening happening. You know, you look at Extinction Rebellion and all the different parties in the general election bidding over how many billion trees they could plant um, and the rise of veganism and all the So, you know, young people in particular are starting to say, hang on a minute, you know, we don't want you to destroy our planet. Um, and I think maybe you know, we're not far from, from the point where actually that becomes mainstream and suddenly politicians have to take all of this much more seriously than they, they have done because it's what people want. 
Um, so we just got to keep pushing for that, haven't we, one way or another. And, uh, you know, maybe we can do it. I don't know, but we've got to try because, because, you know, the, everything is at stake, basically. The, these Zoom meetings is always a bit limp, isn't it? I've given a few talks and then it sort of fizzles out and everyone clicks. <laughs> oh, well, we've just had one, one other question come through, actually, which is... Go on, then. Please ask about how we share best practices across councils and organisations like the National Trust. Ooh. Oh. Together, don't you? I, I don't know. I mean, I, I, it's not, I don't work in that kind of organisation at all. Yeah. Universities, universities are notoriously hopeless at sharing best practice, I think. <laughs> I, yeah. well, it's, a, it's a great embarrassment to me that the University of Sussex campus is absolutely useless for, well, it's not useless, for, it's, it's, it's mown to death, basically. No. We even had an edict come round for, saying that they had to mow the grass because if they didn't, there would be lots of pests, including snakes living in it. I, I, at which point I just didn't know what to say, really. I, I would be, I'd be fantastic if there were snakes on the campus, but <laughs> as far as I can see. Anyway, sorry, I haven't got a clue to, to answer that last one. All right. It'd be a good place to leave. That's fantastic. Karen, would you like to say a few words about the next event as well coming up, just before we do? All right, Thank yes. You. Yeah. yeah, we on have... On the screen got... now. Okay, brilliant. Yeah, it's called The Fold and Its Farm. It's a virtual tour of an organic community farm in Worcestershire. Um, so we're hoping to have a, a tour. They're going to explain their history and have some top tips on organic farming. So we know that you've all been trying to grow food this summer, maybe in your garden organically. So some practical tips. And like today, we'll have a question mark answer session. Tickets are on Eventbrite. It's on Wednesday, July the 22nd, and it's at six o'clock. We'd love you to join us. Fantastic. And I think probably what we ought to do is to um, perhaps to, we'll unmute everybody and allow everybody yes. to perhaps to uh, give a, a round of uh, applause and uh, as a way of thanks for, for Dave for, for his talk tonight. So I'll just do that now and uh, let's see if that works. Right, everyone's unmuted. So uh, thank you very much. Good evening, everyone. So, Dave, where, where can we next see you or hear from you? You're going to be on the next Well, possibly on the Today programme tomorrow morning, or if not, on the 17th of July, Gardener's World. Oh, Gardener's World. Wow, I love Gardener's World. Gardener's World. <laughs> hey. Big fan of Gardener's World. Okay, brilliant. Hey. I get to the garden, unfortunately, but. <laughs> well, thank you very much, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 Thanks a lot. Bye. 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 Thank you. Bye. Hi, Karen. Hi. That was all right. Yeah. Only problem was that we hadn't realised that we had a limit of a hundred. I know, but we've recorded it. Yes. So, can we send out the link to the recording to the people who haven't can join? Yes, that's what we'll do. So, I better, yeah. better um, exactly. stop recording now then. Uh, okay. With, with a big apology. Yes. But we've never had an event with this many people before, so... No. <laughs> it's a problem, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he was good, great though, wasn't he? It's a good problem. It is a good problem. Yeah, we can't complain. <laughs>